we we live in a very momentous uh, momentous time in Africa. You may not realize this, but you're living at a very critical time uh, in the world for Africa. Uh, Africa is a continent with great promise. Uh, in fact, a couple of people agree that um, the future of Christianity in the world in the next couple of years will be shaped by Africa. So, bottom line is that we are multiplying very, very rapidly. That's good. Uh, but that, that increment um, of population in Africa will translate to very serious implications to the way that Christianity looks like in the world. A um, couple of guys have said some significant things about this. A guy called Philip Jenkins uh, said, already by 2050, Africa will be home to more than a billion Christians and by far the largest concentration on the planet. Pew Research is the most, probably the most reliable research for matters, religion, and especially Christianity. They say that if demography is destiny, then Christianity's future lies in Africa. They say by 2060, a plurality of Christians, more than 4 in 10, again 40%, will call sub-Saharan Africa home. And, and, in, and in response to this, a lot of us are asking ourselves if, if the future of Christianity kind of depends on what Christianity looks like in Africa. Isn't that an amazing burden on us right now in this moment to start asking ourselves some seriously big questions about the future of Christianity and what we can do now to make sure that by the time world Christianity is shaped by Africa, that by that time, that type of Christianity is vital, true, and faithful to biblical Christianity. And a gentleman called uh, Delano Adadevo of Campus Crusade, he said that, yes, by 2050, 40% of the world's Christian will be African. And he said this, that is the new shape of Christianity. What a tragedy. What a tragedy if at that time Christianity in Africa is diluted. What a tragedy. And I agree. What a tragedy. And he said we need to make sure now, we need to ensure in this moment, that's why I'm saying we're in a critical point in history, we need to make sure now that African Christianity is biblical and Christ-centered and kingdom-driven. There have been some people who have said and obviously when we hear this as African people, we get very offended. But there have been some people who have said that Christianity in Africa is a mile wide but an inch deep. That Christianity in Africa is a mile wide but only an inch deep. And that's a very offensive statement to many of us in Christianity. But we should stop before we get offended and ask ourselves, is this statement true? My own view of this statement is yes and no. No, because when people say this, the majority of those who say this come from a Western perspective, where to them, the depth of Christianity means theological training and formal theological training for that. So they're comparing how the West, for example, has so many theologically trained pastors, etc., etc., and how many of our pastors in Africa usually have no formal theological training at all, or very little, if at all. And, uh, and therefore they say that that is the depth that is missing. If that is the criteria for Christianity's depth, I say no. Because you might have all the theological training in the world and not be a faithful disciple. I think that the depth of Christianity is not based on theological training alone. There are other criteria. I think uh, the real criteria is really just communion with Jesus. And um, I also secondly disagree because it is not just an African problem. I think that if we think of depth of Christianity as faithful communion with Jesus, then that is not just an African problem. I think uh, it is a global phenomenon that a lot of places where people call themselves Christians, they don't live the life that shows 
that they are in communion with Jesus. And so that's not just an African problem. But on the other hand, yes, yes, I agree we have a problem. We have a problem in the sense that if we look at depth of Christianity as communion with Jesus that is shown by fruit of obedience to Jesus, then even by that truly biblical criteria, we have a problem. We have a problem not only on this continent, we have a problem in this country. Kenya is supposedly 80% Christian. That's the statistics if you go to joshuaproject.net and other such important uh, places to study Christianity and religion. But if Kenya is 80% Christian, and, uh, and I hear a lot of optimism, even more optimism now and so on about, uh, about this country and its Christianity, I won't get into all of the politics of that, but if we are truly 80% Christian, why are we still so deeply corrupt? Why are we still losing young people from the church? Why are we home to so many cultic movements in this country? Why are we not sending missionaries even just to other parts of Kenya? Did you know that 33 ethnic groups in Kenya are considered unreached? An unreached people group is a group of people that is less than 2% Christian. That means that they don't have enough Christians to even develop their own church planting movement without external help. There are 33 such ethnic groups in Kenya today. We are not sending missionaries there. Why are our churches so deeply ethnic and exclusive? Um, we have a problem. And so how do we achieve Christian depth for the growing African church? I think the answer to this question is one word, discipleship, discipleship. I think that in the mission focus, as we focus about reaching out, and last time I was here, we talked a lot about living on mission every day in everyday places. Even as we do that, we must always remind ourselves that as we bring people to Jesus, our responsibility is to get them deep in discipleship in order to see a real transformation in their lives and in the lives of the community. Go to John chapter 6. We will begin from verse 22 for our passage this morning. We'll be looking at the journey of discipleship because discipleship is not an event. Discipleship is not a destination. Discipleship is a journey. I don't, I don't want to read that whole passage. It is quite big. Let me just tell you what is happening in John 6 and then we'll read a few verses and then we'll go to the notes. In John chapter 6, Jesus feeds 5,000 men. They counted the men. It was cultural to just count men. Things have changed now, and I'm glad they have. Back in the day, they just counted the men. So it was at least 5,000 men. And so if you count the women and the children, Jesus fed over 10,000 people with only five pieces of bread, five loaves of bread and two fish. A wonderful miracle. And uh, it was well received and welcome by those who enjoyed it. In fact, uh, shortly after that, the next day, we are told from verse 22 that they went looking for Jesus for take two. We love this Jesus. They said, this is truly, he's from God. This, this man is the Messiah. Let's, let's make him king. And the next day they looked for him. So start with me from verse 22. Let's read a few verses. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there. And that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. And then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and they went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, you know, you need to see these people. They're coming to Jesus for the miracle and they just... Very clever uh, with the way they're talking to Jesus. But Jesus knows their motives. As soon as they see him, they're like, Rabbi, Enyaje, where, how, when did you get here? When did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Immediately, and I'm too, what's going on, right? 
And uh, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Okay, 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 Jesus, we can hear you. Verse 28. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works of God, you know, that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is to believe this. Is to, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, uh, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? Uh, what will you do? Mm? As if that is not enough, they went on to suggest. You know, speaking suggestively, eh? Our ancestors, for example, they ate, they ate, Jesus, they ate, they ate, they ate manna, they ate manna huh? in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread. They even caught a verse for Jesus. These guys are hilarious. They think they know the world. You know, they just really know what they want. You know, he gave them bread, right, from heaven to eat, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from, the hev from heaven and gives life to the world. Ah, verse 34 is my favorite verse. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. These people, they tell Jesus, Sir, they call him with respect. From this day forward, always give us this bread. Yes, bread from heaven. Give us bread, Lord. And Jesus declared, I, I am the bread of life. Drops mic. Poof. It just deflates everyone. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You know, my friends, I really want you to go read this chapter at home. From that moment onwards, Jesus says some very, very, very difficult things, including eat my flesh and drink my blood, which to the Jew is like, are you serious? You know, this is anathema. This is unacceptable, right? And so he says all these difficult things until verse 60, we are told, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Ujamaa pati bread. And he's here saying very confusing, difficult things. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing, the words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father enabled him. Pay attention, verse 66, pay close attention to this. Come on, if you've not been listening the whole time, listen, verse 66. And God forbid that this becomes you. You should never be verse 66. Don't become verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. God forbid. Don't become verse 66. You do not, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus turned to the 12. You see, because Jesus had more than 12 disciples and we are told the rest turned away, never to follow him again. So he turns to the 12. Well, Simon Peter, my man, he answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, verse 69, and we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. I'll stop there for today. And uh, this is the word of God. Amen. And thanks be to God. There are three levels of disciples. I'll use this passage descriptively, not prescriptively. A clever way just to say, the way I'm going to interpret this passage is not to tell you so much what we are told to do in that passage. Observe what disciples look like at their different levels. I see three levels of disciples in that passage. Let's look at them. The first level of disciples is just followers of Jesus. Those who are just following Jesus. We are told in verse 2 that a great crowd of people followed him. Usually this level has crowds. This is the level of crowds. They follow Jesus. Why do they follow Jesus? Well, the mark of this stage is that they are seeking. They are seeking for something from Jesus. 
We're told that they were in search of Jesus in verse 24. We're told in verse 26, Jesus said, I know you are looking for me. It's, it's, the crowds seek Jesus. But what do they need at this stage? Why are they seeking Jesus? Well, at this stage, they're looking for the works of Jesus. They're looking for signs and wonders. They're looking for a miracle of turning that bread and feeding multiples. They're looking for signs. Verse 2, they saw the signs. Verse 30, what sign do you do? He said. They, you know, they said. Listen to me carefully. God is a God of signs and wonders, and he will do signs and wonders, but the people who are obsessed with signs and wonders are at the lowest level of discipleship. Only the, only the least mature disciples will follow Jesus for signs and wonders. And he is happy to do signs and wonders, but if you remain a Christian only because of signs and wonders, you have not grown in your level of maturity as a disciple. Jesus was very clear when he said, only a perverse and crooked generation asks for signs. This is interesting because we live in a continent that is obsessed with signs and wonders, don't we? And we, and we see crowds gather to the teachers and workers of miracles all across Africa. Ministries are built and established and flourish in the hundreds and the thousands because they are founded on signs and wonders. And people will travel from far to go and see a sign and a wonder. We must begin to think that all of these people are at their very lowest level of discipleship where they want to see in order to believe, like Thomas. And Jesus said, blessed are those who believe even without seeing. And so God will graciously do signs and wonders that my friends don't get it twisted. It is not signs and wonders that keep people deep in their Christianity. Signs and wonders just get people's attention to begin the journey to follow Jesus. But staying in Jesus is not kept by signs and wonders. Only the really, really immature disciples are attracted by signs and wonders. I don't hear an amen. In church, people who are attracted by signs and wonders are very recent young converts. They're attracted by signs and wonders. Second level of discipleship. The second level of discipleship is those who have moved from following Jesus and they are now abiding with Jesus. They are staying with Jesus. They followed, yes, they saw some signs and wonders, but they chose to stay with Jesus. You see, the 12 disciples stayed when everyone else left. And these, these are the abiding disciples. Uh, abiding with Jesus even when he disappoints us. In verse 35, they came for bread. He did not give them bread. He disappointed them. Some people will come to Jesus because he will give them A, B, C, D. They have been promised all these things that Jesus would give. God is sovereign. He knows what good gifts to give to, to what children. And we will not manipulate him to give us anything that he has not planned to give to us. Of course, he invites us to pray and to seek and to knock. But at the end of the day, sometimes he will disappoint us in his manifold wisdom. If you go away from Jesus because you did not get what you wanted from Jesus, you're just proving that you are not a real disciple in the first place. A true disciple of Jesus, a growing disciple of Jesus in this journey of discipleship, the next level is that they stay, they abide with Jesus, even when he disappoints us. We stay with Jesus even when he confuses us. Verse 60, they said, this teaching is too difficult. Who can understand it? Let's not pretend that there are many things about God that confuse us. Let's not pretend that there are many mysteries about this God we serve that we don't understand. And a lot of times it confuses us. It leaves us with questions. I have studied apologetics, which is the, you know, the defense of the Christian faith. And I still have questions of my own after studying all of that, isn't it? And you would think I'm supposed to be the answer man. No, I am not. Uh, there is all, we all have to come to a level of crossing uh, a certain boundary of intellectual certainty that is not possible. And we have to just believe. And we all believe, including the scientists and everyone. Everyone crosses a line of faith. 
And we all have to cross that line. And so at the point of confusion, at the point when you don't understand some things about God and you don't understand some things about how this thing works, will you go away just because you don't understand it? A real disciple stays even when he's confused, just because he trusts Jesus. A real disciple stays even when it isolates us. Look at the 12 disciples. All the others left. You can imagine the crowds and they were leaving one by one, one by one. Jesus is left with 12. He turns to them and says, how about you guys? Are you going to go? Everyone else is gone. Friends, let's, let's, let's be honest. As we follow Jesus, many times we will not be popular. As we follow Jesus, you know this in your own family. You know this in your own workplace. As you continue to know Jesus and obey him and to live by his word, there will come a time when you're not popular. There will come a time when people will seclude you because of your position with Jesus, because of the stand you have made for Jesus. There will come a time when everyone else at work has compromised and you're the only one who's standing steadfast. There will come a time when everyone of your friends has compromised and you're the only one who's still standing with Jesus and you feel isolated and alone. A true disciple, that next level, beyond just miracles and signs, the level of enduring and standing and abiding with Jesus, even when everyone else leaves. That's the next level of discipleship. That's depth. These types of people, they are marked by listening to the words of Jesus. Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. These are people who love the word of God. I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed you have a study, midweek study of the word. Right now you're studying Romans, one of the best books of the Bible. These are people who are coming on Wednesday to study Romans. These are people who are hungry for the word. These are people who want to get deep in the word of God. And, and in fact, this is exactly what is needed for this stage. It is the word of Jesus. It is the words of eternal life. These are people who are seeking to understand the word. They are studying it. They're putting a bit of investment to understand a bit of, you know, some tools that we can use to understand some words in the Bible. Well, how do we interpret the Bible correctly? How do we understand the Bible culture that helps us to interpret the Bible? They're putting some work into how do I understand the word? They're beginning to memorize verses and hiding the word of God in their hearts. The word, the word, they are people of the word. And therefore, typically in church, these are the faithful, obedient servants of God. They, they have known the word and they're seeking to obey it. They're not just seeking knowledge. They are, they've known the word of God and they're seeking to live it out faithfully. And usually it will manifest in the way that they serve others in the church and outside of the church, of course. And they're living a faithful life of integrity in the world. It might come to you as a surprise. You might think those who follow Jesus also believe Jesus to some extent. You might think those who abide with Jesus also believe Jesus to some extent. And yes, I agree. But my friend, there's a level of believing Jesus that comes from an intimate knowledge of Jesus. Listen to the words of Simon Peter in verse 69. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. After being with you this long, Jesus, we have come to believe. It did not happen in a moment. As we followed you, stage one, as we stayed with you, abiding with you, stage two, now this level, we have come to believe and to know. And the word know, from the Greek nosko, or gnosis, is contact knowledge. All of you can claim to know the president because we saw him on TV, voted for him, those who voted. If you haven't met that gentleman in person, sat down with him, have a cup of coffee or something, have some conversations with him, you do not know his excellency. W S R. You do not know him. You just know about him. There's a lot of people who know about Jesus. They claim to be disciples of Jesus. And just because they saw some miracles of Jesus and they were there when the miracle happened. And just because they have read the Bible, the words of Jesus, they think they know Jesus. Jesus 
is a person, the Holy One of God, the image of the invisible God. Jesus can be known personally. His word is an entry point to know his character and to know about him is an entry point. But this level I'm talking about is a level of knowing Jesus. Yes, you may not have seen him physically, but there are people who get to the level of knowing Jesus. They are aware of his presence every second of every day. These are not people who do devotions in the morning and close their Bible and go to work. These are people who walk with Jesus to work. Devotion does not end. Time with Jesus is not quiet time. It is an abiding communion with a person throughout the day. These are people who know Jesus. They walk with Jesus. They are marked with com communing with Jesus. We have come to believe and to know, contact knowledge. We are in contact with you. We, we see things about you that, that are so real. We know you as Messiah for ourselves. What is needed to get to this stage is something you could call the spirit revelation of Jesus. Because the word of God is an indicator of the will of God. But the word goes with the spirit. And the more you stay in the word, the more you get so acquainted with the ways of Jesus and as you lean to the spirit of God, revelation, Paul said to, to the Ephesians in chapter 1, I pray you have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Revelation is the unveiling of what was previously hidden. It comes from the Greek word apocalypso, which is what we have as the name of the book of Revelation. It's an apocalypse. It's an unavailing of what was previously hidden. The more you know the word of Jesus, the more you seek him in prayer and in, and in communion with him and, and you're staying in his word and quiet, in quiet time and so on. The more you're staying in his word, the more you seek his spirit to unveil the knowledge of Christ to you, the more, the more, <laughs> the more you get to know him, your eyes, your spiritual eyes open so that beyond just the words that have been written about him, you know him, him. He's a real person. I don't know how many of us in this room know Jesus. You know that he's around. And so because you know him, you walk with an awareness of his presence everywhere you go. You see, now at this level, struggling with sin becomes much less because everywhere you go, you're just aware. There's no room you will go and lock yourself in. There's no computer you will go and look at. There's no place you will drive to where Jesus is not there. So these people are so aware of the presence of Jesus that they're not even seeking a miracle to know he's there. They're not even, you know, they're not even having to remind themselves even like a scripture in order to really confirm that he's there. They are aware their spirits have connected with the very presence of Jesus who actually said, I will be with you to the very end of the age. After all, isn't he Emmanuel? And we just sang here. But do you know him as Emmanuel? Do you know Jesus with you? Do you walk with Jesus every morning when you go to work? Do you walk with Jesus? Do you know him at that level? And you know, my friends, this level, this is where in church, this is where leaders ought to be. This is where leaders ought to be. And I'm saying ought to be because I know, I've been a pastor for many years and I know that even many pastors, even myself as I look at myself on that crucible, I don't know that I'm always there, but that's where we ought to be as leaders. Now, I, I'm landing this plane already, and I want to give you guys a maxim. A maxim is one statement that helps remember the whole message. One statement. Our call to discipleship is a journey. 
It is a journey to not only follow Jesus, but also abide with him and believe him increasingly. The more we know him by his word and his spirit. Let me say that again. Our call to discipleship is a journey to not only follow Jesus, but to also abide with him. That's the next level. And then the next level to believe him increasingly. Take him at his word, right? The more we know him by his word and his spirit. I think that all of this has some huge implications for discipleship in Africa. Let me finish with that. It means, number one, that Jesus, and not any prophet, not any apostle, not any pastor, not any bishop, Jesus and Jesus alone ought to be at the center of our discipleship. Can we hear an amen for that? Are you not troubled that in this continent, people can quote their pastors so well than they can quote scripture? Our bishop often says, our prophet says, in fact, I was watching a video and there was this man of God from Nigeria who said, and this is an individual who will not quote a single verse of scripture for you. This is a crisis that must change. Can we disciple people in the word of God, the word of Jesus? Lift Jesus high. It is time for preachers and ministers of the gospel in this continent to descend as Jesus ascends. John the Baptist, the greatest of all prophets, Jesus said. But he said, I must decrease that he may increase. After all, it is as we lift the Son of Man high that he will draw men to himself. What happened to lifting Jesus high? Lifting Jesus high. Why is it that rather than lifting Jesus high, men and women of God in this continent, when we see them, we see the end. We don't see them pointing us. We don't see men and women of God in this continent as a window through which we see the magnificence of a glorious Jesus. What we see is magnificent, glorious ministers of God driving this, driving that, bodyguard this, bodyguard that. And we see these men of God lifted up and being celebrated, cities being cleaned, roads being cleaned for them. They are the mighty this, the mighty that. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus in all of this? We preach Jesus and him crucified. He is the king of kings. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And by the way, that's not a verse for future. A lot of times when you read this, we think at one day, Jesus. no, 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 no. That verse is an imperative for now. Because of what Jesus has done and because he's lifted up and been given the name above every other name, now... At the name of Jesus, not at the name of any prophet, at the name of Jesus, not at the name of any apostle, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. Why do we have Christians all over Africa bowing in front of apostles and people and holding onto their TVs and, and begging and praying and begging in front of a TV and kneeling in front of a TV and kneeling in front of an individual? God forbid that should change. If Christianity is being exported from Africa in 2060, are we exporting a veneration of apostle? Are we exporting this magnification of prophets? God forbid. Let's export a Christianity that has Jesus at the center. There is only one king, Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Only Jesus deserves praise and honor and adoration and magnification. He alone is king. Let Africa hear. Jesus and Jesus only is king. Second implication. Signs and wonders have their place in early faith, but it is not what makes disciples long term. Signs and wonders have their place in early faith, but it is not what makes strong disciples long term. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 said, Signs are for unbelievers. They ought to see signs and wonders and ask themselves, wow, 
I guess there is a God. You see, that's, that's, the, lo that's the level of, I guess there is a God. I guess God exists. You see that level? That's the level of signs and wonders. It's the level that gets somebody's attention to say, wow, I guess there's a God in heaven. I guess, I guess God exists. That's such a low level. That's an entry point into relationship. But my friend, if you keep staying at that place where you just need things from God, always looking, always looking for signs and wonders from God in order to trust him, that's such a low level. And always coming to God for something, that's such a low level. You don't know him, you just want things from him. I was telling pastor this morning, don't you all have a phone number of someone who is either a relative or a friend or a neighbor? When you see that number calling you, you just know. You start asking yourself, do I have any money? Um, because this individual only calls you for one thing and one thing alone. When you see that number, you just know, oi, bro, I need this, I need this. And when you see that phone number, you check your impressive balance before you even receive it. You know. You know where this phone call is going. It's never about anything else. They just want something from you. Every single time they call. How many of you have people like that in your life? It's okay. I have. I have. It's okay, no shame, no shame. Oh, and by the way, can I just say, can I just say that for, 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 for pastors, you guys, you, some of you are that person to, to pastors. Because the only time you call your pastor is when you need something. Ah, shame on you, in Jesus' name, shame on you. Yeah, yeah, shame on you, shame on you. Yeah, I've been a pastor, and your pastor won't say this, but me, I'm not your pastor, uh, you will do nothing to me. I'm just telling you the truth. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. Why is it bad? What do you feel when someone calls you when, when they want something? Only when they want something. You feel used, isn't it? They don't really care about you. When they're happy, they don't call you. When they have a celebration, they don't call you. They don't invite you into their parties. They don't invite you to their weddings. Oh, but when they have someone sick in hospital, when they're creating that WhatsApp group to raise fund, funds, when they have someone to bury, you find yourself in a WhatsApp group one morning that you do not even, you know. But why do we do the same thing to God over and over again? We don't know him. We don't have intimacy with him. We don't invite him to our good times and to our parties and to thank him and praise him and worship him and just to know him. But oh, we will fast 21 days when you want something. And after fasting that long when we don't get it, God, I'm disappointed. I fasted. As if fasting is the thing that turns the arm of God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. Before you ask anything, love him. That's the greatest commandment. He just wants to be loved. He's happy to help you with this and that, but do you love him? If you're all about signs and wonders and getting this and getting that from God, you are so far away from knowing God. So far away. Infant in the faith. If you're driven by signs and wonders. Thirdly, obedience-based discipleship is the key to transformation. In other words, if discipleship means just more information, more knowledge, here's a new study, here's a new this, here's a new that, more and more knowledge, more and more information, and we do nothing with it. Paul said, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. You better know a few things that you do so, so well. You better know a few things that you obey so, so well. You know, nowadays we are planting churches in some of these rural places, and sometimes when I go there, I shut my mouth, and I say, Lord, teach me from these people. They know so little, but their obedience is so high. And some of us, we know so much, but our obedience is just tiny. We just want more and more and more knowledge, more and more, more another seminar, another conference, another study, another this, another, but we don't do... Whoever hears my words and obeys is my disciple, Jesus said. Better little knowledge with much obedience than much knowledge with little obedience. You're building a curse for yourself. The more you know, the more you're responsible to obey. You better not know much if you don't plan to obey it. Because to whom much is given, 
much is expected. Finally, and I'm saying this with all grace, knowing that I'm also a leader. Let me say this. Only mature disciples modeling faithful obedience to the word and deep communion with Jesus should be leaders in church. Nothing more, nothing less. Do you want to be a leader in church? Are you already a leader in church? Only mature disciples modeling faithful obedience to the word and a deep communion with Jesus. These are people who have been with Jesus. These are the people who know and walk with Jesus. These are the people who should be leaders in church. Nothing more, nothing less. This is not just an African problem, but as I travel different places by God's grace, I find that the church all around is marked by a very interesting quagmire. Here's the quagmire. There seems to be a separation in church between discipleship and leadership. It's as if you can grow into a very mature disciple without eventually leading or that you can become a leader in church without necessarily becoming a strong, mature disciple. Are you getting my problem here? Like, discipleship and leadership are treated like two separate things, and that's just really a problem. That's, that's such a misnomer. This is one of the biggest crises in the church worldwide. There's people who come into church who don't know Jesus, who don't follow Jesus, who don't abide with Jesus, who don't believe Jesus, who are leaders in church. Or who wants to become leaders in church. And we let them. God have mercy on us. We let them because, hey, I guess they have a few shillings here and there. They can help us. They are connected here and there. They can do a few things. Follow closely. Listen. This is a problem. It's a problem that there are people who have become strong disciples over time. And you can see, faithful. This guy, he follows Jesus. This guy, he's in the word. He's obedient. He's living a faithful life. Oh, this guy, this guy walks with Jesus. And that guy is not a leader in church. That's a problem. On the contrary, you're like, this guy is not following Jesus. This guy is not abiding with Jesus. This guy is not believing in Jesus. But he's a leader in church. A problem. A problem. God forgive us. And God help us. It will take some mature, bold leaders. Those of us that are pastors, those of us that have started churches and ministries, to reevaluate all of this and say, Lord, forgive us for as far as we've gone with this type of stuff. And that's just re recalibrate some things. Look, there are ministries that need to go and tell their leaders, we are starting over again. Everyone who is a leader, let's go back to square one. Okay, we are reevaluating this whole leadership thing and tying leadership to discipleship. It's a, you know, you go to churches where at, we have a discipleship meeting or we have this type of meeting to get into the word, and then all the leaders are absent. And then all you have is all these Jewish prayer warriors, and they're looking at prayer warriors as watuki dog. At, these are the ones who are not leaders. The prayer warriors are not leaders. And, and those people who are faithful, obeying, and or say, our missions, those are the ones who are not leading anything in church. Uh, but they're they growing in faith and they're doing so much. But no, they have no influence in church. And those who don't read the word, they don't pray. Those are the ones who are making all the decisions for those who are reading the word. And those, Do we have a problem or not? <laughs> Thank you. Rise on your feet.